so I thought after my uh, game type scan explanation video, I might uh, do the rest of the scanner here and show you the awesome way that the freaking rest of the scanner works. So let's just get to it. So I'm not going to go down into absolutely the finest grain details possible because there is a lot of details in here and uh, it, you would just go on and on and on. But I'll give you the uh, salient stuff and I'll skip over the stuff that's not that interesting. Uh, also, one thing to note is that this scanner can actually scan for a lot of things that Angel Loader doesn't use because I wrote this scanner before I wrote Angel Loader. So there'll be a lot of uh, disabled things. Uh, let me see if I can find one here. This, for example, if FM scanner full code, uh, it's this is not defined, so this stuff is disabled to save file size because I just like to do that. It's like a game to me. You just get the file as small as possible and as fast as possible. Yep, <laughs> it's awesome. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, the stuff that Angel Loader doesn't use is commented out, and I'll just skip over that. But, starting from the beginning of the interesting things, I've talked about the game type, so I won't get into that. If you want to know about that, look at my uh, Which Game video where I talk about uh, fast and accurate game type scans. But, I'm even going to remember to set the DPI up this time. Okay, so let's start with Scan Current FM. Basically, uh, you can scan one FM at a time, or you can scan a whole bunch at a time, and it's tuned for performance when you're scanning a whole bunch at a time, uh, because that's when you really need it. So here's the loop where you're scanning a bunch at a time. It's basically just a lot of cruft in here, but the really salient stuff is in the Scan Current FM. This is the full scan. So we can scan zip files, seven zip files, and uh, uncompressed... FMs in folders on disk. So for 7-zip files, we actually just extract them to a temp folder and thereafter treat them just like an extracted FM because 7-zip files are not very amenable to random access scanning, so we just extract the whole thing to disk and then we get random access so that we can just not have to worry. But zip files, we actually scan them directly from the archive because it's a lot faster. So you notice a lot of if blocks like this, if FM is zip, else. So ideally, you'd want to somehow wrap up all of these calls into just like one function call that would do all the if stuff behind the scenes for you. But you don't really want to have these if blocks all the time, ideally, because it's messy. But because the way you read zip files versus the way you read folders on disk is almost like completely 90 degrees from each other, with a zip file, you have to like loop through all the file names. If you want to find if a folder exists or a file exists, you loop through all the file names, which are just strings, and you like pull parts out of the string to detect if a file or folder is there. Whereas if you want to get a file from disk, you just ask if the file exists with one call. You don't have to do a loop. So there's really no way to put them together, not performantly anyway that I've found. So I end up having all of these if blocks all around for performance. So. You know, if you're an experienced coder and you're cringing at that, I apologize. I couldn't find a better way to do it. So that's that. But this is still all just kind of the cruft. Scanning size is not very interesting. If you're interested in this text, you can kind of read it. It's a performance thing. Makes it messy. There's a <laughs> This scanner is really kind of horrible in terms of code. Like, you wouldn't want to code like this normally. But... It just makes it faster. Like, this is kind of a big ball of mud, and it's like that on purpose for performance. Because, like, the less you have to call all over the place, the more you can combine things into single loops, the faster you are. So that's why this stuff gets kind of really crappy. But, uh, cr crappy looking. But it works great. So, to start off with here, we want to cache the FM data. So, basically, we're going to need to scan through readme files uh, many times. So uh, we don't want to keep pulling the readme file from disk or from the zip file every time we want to scan through it. So we want to cache all the text of each readme file in the FM. And we also do some other things in here. But uh, yeah, this is <laughs> it may look small, but there's a lot going on here. So basically, for zip files, there's this big loop here that you can kind of see here, this loop right here, it's looping through all of the files in the zip file, and it is doing a ton of stuff in this loop. And like, this is like, don't ever do this if you can help it, but this is a performance thing. Everything that it has to do with all of the files, it does in this one loop, because the idea is we only want to iterate through the files in the zip archive once. We do not want to do it again, because there could be a huge number of files in zips, and we don't want to have to search through all of them constantly every time we want to find something. So we do one full loop only. And then what we do is we split off 
all of the files that we're going to need into separate lists. So you can see up here, we have miss files, strings dir files, books dir files. So all the files in these directories, we split them off into these smaller lists so that when we iterate them later, we don't have to iterate the entire zip file. We only have to iterate these small subsections of files that we're interested in, right? So that's how we do performance there. And at the same time as we're doing all of that, we are also fingerprinting System Shock 2, which I explain in my game type video. Uh, basically, we're just kind of looking for files which signify that this is probably a System Shock 2 fan mission. We're setting that bool there. And we're also doing the custom resources scan. So you see all this? This, uh, this is basically like Dark Loader. I just put this in because Dark Loader has it, and I figured, why not? I can, so hey. So uh, this is whether the mission has any of these things. So we're doing this check inside of this loop as well because we have to look through all of the files for that. So instead of iterating it twice, we just shove it right in the loop and it makes it horrendous looking, but it's fast. <laughs> Here is the else for the, uh, for the FM on disk, not in a zip file, but this is the extracted FM thing. And you see it's completely different. We're not having to do a loop. Instead, we just do a series of calls to find if files exist. So that's why we have to have these if blocks. There's some little loops in there, but this is completely different, unfortunately. But that's that big loop. And also, we've checked for Thief 3 in this loop as well, I forgot to say. We're basically scanning for just some folder structures. I've mentioned that in a game type video, but just to quickly go over it again, we're looking to see if the fan mission contains this folder, content slash T3 slash maps, and if it happens to have any files with the right extension in them, which I I can't find where that is, but yeah, that's all we're looking for. So we do that in this loop as well. So it's custom resources, Thief 3 detection, System Shock 2 fingerprinting, and splitting all the files off into lists. All of it done at once in this loop here. So if the mission is for Thief 3, then we just return here because we don't need to do any of this other stuff But because Thief 3 doesn't have miss files. But if we're not Thief 3, then we need to check if the fan mission has any miss files in the base folder, because if it doesn't, it's not a fan mission, or it's an invalid fan mission, and we can't do anything else, and we have to just quit. Then we have to check for used miss files, which I, again, explained this in the game type video, but basically sometimes missions have dummy miss files, and I'll get into that a bit more later, but uh, they're basically like invalid miss files that aren't real miss files, and we have to check that all of our missed files are only going to be used ones rather than dummy ones because we don't want to scan the invalid ones and get a wrong result. So we have to check for the used missed files here. We basically just scan through the missflag.stir file and check if they're specified there and if they are, they're used. However, we also need to keep a list of all the missed files, even the non-used ones, because we, we're going to need to cross-reference these lists later on. So that's what we're doing here. This is like way more complicated than it needs to be. It's for performance, don't worry about it. <laughs> so after we're done with that, then we're done with that and we can move on to, uh, you know, this other stuff here. So the setter add title. So you know in Angel Loader there's uh, multiple titles. So sometimes we might scan uh, multiple different titles. So we just throw them in a list here because we're not sure which one is gonna be correct sometimes. So. For authors, we just get one, but for titles, every time we find a new one that's different, we just kind of add it to a list rather than replacing the one, right? So that's going to come into play later. And then here we have the uh, new dark and game type checks. Now, we can scan for new dark in this scanner, but Angel Loader doesn't use that, so I'm not going to get into it. If you want to know about game types, look at the game type video, as I said. I'm not going to say anything more about that here because it's a whole topic. And... Here we have check info files. So here we start scanning for data, title, author, tags, release date, that sort of thing. And we want to first check the FM info files, and there's three different ones we can check. We can check fminfo.xml, which is a file format created by Teliamed, and there's only three of them in existence, to my knowledge. <laughs> but he did put them with a few of his missions, so I decided, well, why not support them, because it does have some info in it. This is fm.ne. This is a new dark file where you can put some information in title and tags and release date and so forth like that. This is mod.ne, a System Shock 2 only file where it specifies the same kind of things. There's nothing terribly special about these. We basically just uh, scan them each in turn. And if you want to, you can see the methods right here. So uh, this is the fm.ne. The only thing really interesting happening in here is that we have to handle multi-line description keys, values, like 
not even close to any spec. Don't even do that. You're supposed to use backslash ends, but sometimes the description is multiple lines. We have to kind of handle that. We have to handle a lot of things that are non-standard and weird because we're dealing with other people's data, so we have to be very flexible. <laughs> so, so yeah, we have to do a lot of work here. But AngelOder doesn't actually use this description stuff anyway, so we can just ignore it all for AngelOder's purposes. Other than that, we're basically just grabbing values, and then it's the same thing with mod done in e. Slightly different formats, but, you know, essentially the same thing. There's so nothing terribly crazy going on there. So we might end up with some values filled out from scanning these files if they exist. But otherwise, we're going to just carry on. Now we go and read and cache and set readme files. Now I did kind of get into this in the uh, dev talk number four video. But I can just quickly go over it again. So readme scanning is kind of the, uh, the main place that AngelOrder is going to try to get values from. It, 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 we would like to get values from the FM info files, but if they don't exist or they don't provide all the values we need, we're going to have to scan through the readmes. So we can scan through plain text readmes, uh, .wri readmes, which are basically plain text with garbage at the top, as it says, so we treat them like plain text. We can scan GLML readmes, which is Garrett Loader Markup Language, which is sort of like a, a HTML-like, like, like a small subset HTML tag-like thing. Very, very easy to convert to plain text. You just strip the tags out. So it's, you know, we do that down at the bottom here. It's nothing crazy. We just, you know, take all the, uh, you know, tags with the square brackets around them out of the text. And there's our plain text for that. And we can scan RTF files. That's rich text. Now, I went into this in the last number four video. But basically, we have to convert the RTF files to plain text. The normal way to do it is to use the built-in rich text box to do it. But that's slow and use a lot of memory. So I've written my own converter. And uh, my converter allows streams which are not seekable, right? Because in the zip files, you can't actually randomly seek within a compressed file inside of a zip archive. Uh, you, you can only read it forward from the start to the end. So I want to be fast and not have to read the entire readme file into memory and then go through it again and and take up twice the memory you can convert it to plain text. So I just have it so that the RTF converter allows non-seekable streams. It can read the, uh, the whole RTF file and convert it to plain text without ever seeking backwards in the stream. So that's a little feature I had. But uh, it's a custom converter. It's fast. And, uh, and then it converts it to plain text. So at the end, all of our readmes will, one way or another, end up as plain text at the end of this function here. And they'll be cached so that we can scan them later on. Oh, and one more thing that's being done in here is that the last modified date is also being placed into the uh, readme entries. And that's because we might have to check the last modified date of the readme file in order to get the release date later on if we can't find it anywhere else. So we do that as well. So now we have the release date. So the first place we want to read it from is the readme, like inside the text of the readme. Now you might think, will it be easier to just grab the date from a last modified date of a file, and it would, but the readme date might be more accurate because the last modified date of a file might end up wrong if it was, you know, modified a week before release or if its date just got screwed up or something, whereas the date written in the readme is likely to be written out intentionally, and so if it's incorrect, the author's going to notice and won't make it incorrect, right? So. In order to read the date out of the readme, though, we have to have a fairly flexible human-readable date parser. So string to date here tries its absolute best to parse a human-readable date into a computer-readable date, which, you know, it gets crazy. It, does, it can't always get it correct because some dates are just ambiguous. But if you see here, we have a ton of different possible date formats for day, month, year. And all of these are going to be supported. And we support, you know, first, second, third, fourth with the st erd, earth kind of text. We support that. So it's never 100% correct, but this is pretty darn accurate. So that's the first thing we do. Oh, yes, and I also should mention here that in the fm.ne file, there is a particular spec for this format. Oh, that's not the right one. Yeah, here. Where the date is supposed to be written out in Unix time... Uh, hex encoded. So basically it'll look like just a big hexadecimal string and that encodes the number of seconds since 1970 or something like that. It might be milliseconds, I can't remember. But um, 
you're supposed to write the dates out like that, but a lot of FM.NE files have a human readable date. That's not to spec, but we still have to handle it, so we actually uh, still convert the date here. We, uh, we see if it's a proper hex date, and if it is, we just convert it like that, but if it's human readable, then we use this string to date thing here again in order to try to extract it out. And the same thing with fminfo.xml. Now, if we can't find a date there, then we look for the first readme files last modified date, and if that one's not valid, then we look for the first used miss files last modified date, and if we can't find it there, then we just give up and return nothing. So that's how that works. Now, title and included missions. Included missions are the names of the submissions in a campaign. Angel Order doesn't use that currently, so we'll skip over that. However, we have here get mission names. So this can get all of the mission names of, uh, of a campaign, but what it can also do is it can find the title of a mission, and it's a lot more intricate than you might think. So we're basically looking at the titles.stir file. It could also sometimes be called title.stir. So this is what one looks like. So you see there's all of these lines. There's a title and then a number, and then there's short and a number. And usually a title.stir will have all of the stock mission titles here, and we we don't we want to ignore those, right? We want to get the actual mission's title, and we don't want to accidentally get a stock mission's title. So it might look like we can't do much, that we just have to scan through here and hope, but actually we can be very precise with this. Because you remember how I said we wanted a list of all the missed files and then a list of just the used missed files? We are going to cross-reference those with this file here because these numbers are the numbers of the miss files. So here is uh, the Samurite deathmatch, and then here is the missflag.stir file for this campaign, and it is a two-mission campaign, okay? So you see in the missflag.stir here, we have got a bunch of skip files, which means these miss files either don't exist or they do, but we should skip them. These two are the only ones that we should not skip, so there's two missions in this campaign, okay? Now... In this list here, we have 19 and 20, and then in this here, 19 and 20 are the used miss files. So right off the bat, we know that we don't have to look at any of these because these are all skip, right? Because these numbers match up to these numbers, okay? So we can just ignore all of these without any guesswork at all because they're skip. So we know that there's two missions in the campaign which means we know that we can't get the title of the campaign from either of these, because these are going to be the titles of the missions in the campaign, not the campaign itself. So we cannot get the title from these, because they're both specified here as missions. So we can't actually do anything with anything in this list. But you see there's this title zero line up here. This is not actually an official game spec line title zero, but title zero is something that uh, I believe Darkloader came up with that you could just put here and the game would ignore it, but Darkloader would detect it if there's a title zero line, and this is gonna be the title of the campaign. So if we see a title zero line, we can just say, oh, this is the campaign title, so this is gonna be the title, and we can take that as our title and, and stick it in the list of titles and just ignore the rest of this stuff. Now, what happens if we don't have a title zero line? Here's another mission. This is Monastery of St. Farah. Now, there's no title zero line. There's all the uh, stock thief gold uh, names here. And then title 15, there's the Monastery of St. Farah. But we don't yet have any way of knowing whether this is the name of the actual campaign or whether it's just a stock name or what. So let's look at the missflag.stir for this mission. Okay, so here we are now. You notice Miss 1 has no loadout, but I believe that's just a keeper's training. And if you skip the training, you go straight to, uh, you know, whatever the next non-skip mission is. So we can ignore this, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I didn't plan for it. Whoops. But yeah, there's only one mission with no briefing and end. So because we only have one non-skippable mission, we know that we can actually treat this as the title of the mission because it's not a campaign. There's only one mission in the mission. So... Unlike with the campaign where we could not take these titles because they're going to be titles of individual missions, this one, there's only one, so we can, in fact, take this one as long as there's only one non-skip mission there. So in this case, this is going to be our title. Okay, so now we come to Broken Triad here. Now, Broken Triad is a campaign with two missions in it, and as you see, it has no title zero line. And you notice there's three lines here, not two, but three that could potentially be our title, but we know this is a campaign, right? So normally we would just ignore all of these things because we can't know which one is right. But you see here, we have Miss 22 labeled as skip, 
and Miss 20 and 21 are labeled as not skip. So these ones are real missions, so we can't take any titles from these because it's a campaign. But what about this one? Well, this one is labeled as skip, but then again, all of these are also labeled as skip. So we can't just say, well, the first one we find that's labeled as skip, we take that as our title because then we would get running interference or any number of these. But there's actually something different about this. And that is, you see there are actually three miss files in Broken Triad. The first two are real missions. This one, 176k, suspiciously tiny, is actually a completely invalid miss file. It's just garbage in there. I don't know what it is, but it's not a real miss file. So what we do is we say, okay, if we've got a miss file that's labeled skip and the file actually exists in the FM, and if there's only one file like that, so there's only one file in here that exists and is labeled skip, then this is our title because some FMs do this. I, I don't know if the whole reason for having the dummy miss file is just so that they can put the title in this line. You'd think they would just use the title zero line, so I don't know if that's the whole reason, but it seems like it. So if we have this setup, one dummy miss file that is specified as skip, and then two or more real miss files, we take the one dummy miss file specified as skip, reference it to the title list, and this is now our title. Bam! <laughs> it's pretty clever. So uh, there's three or four or whatever different ways we can get titles out of here. It's crazy nice. This is a great source. But it's possible that we may not get one out of here, so let's continue on. Okay, so the next place we look for titles is in the README. So if we go here, our special logic is title. So we are going to be looking in lines. Now, here's where we go line by line through each readme, and we try to look for a title. So there's a lot of pattern matching going on in here. So here's some excludes. We want to exclude certain phrases, you know, just to get more accuracy. And the first thing that we do is we just do a simple check through the readme for just like, obvious places where a title could be specified. So we have the really easy stuff. Title, Bane 2, Cult of the Dam. That's super easy to pattern match. Same thing with the author. Super easy match. The Immortal Thief. So we got the title, we got the author. Done, right? Uh, we could also come down here and, you know, more fuzzy match stuff like this. You know, it doesn't have to be title. It could be mission name. It could be just name. It could be a bunch of different things. Same with author. Um, but this is like the easy stuff, right? So that's what we try first. It's fast and it's easy. And if we get it, then we can just early out. The next place we check is the newgame.stir file. For example, this is the Mystic Lady, and you can see here we have the uh, skip training line here, and then we have the title, the Mystic Lady. So we can actually get the title from this, and what this is, is if we play the Mystic Lady here, you can see that this is our title right here. This is the skip training line. So we can get the title here, but we do have to be a little bit careful because any text could be there, including the text start game or skip training or anything like that. So we want to make sure that we're not getting a title that ends up just being begin or start playing or whatever. So we have some reject phrases here, and we want to make sure that we don't have weird characters there in the beginning when we get in the title. So we reject all of these. We reject if the title is play or start or begin or if it starts with anything like that. Just so, <laughs> let's rock this boat. This is one of the best SFM things. So we reject all of these phrases in order to try to make sure that we're getting an actual title and not just a not, you know, not a title. So that's another place we can grab the title from. You'll notice there's quite a few places. Now, if we don't find it there, we can move on to here. Get titles from top of readmes, okay? So here, what we do is we actually do something kind of clever. So, so what we're looking for here is some text and then the word by or something like the word by, a Thief 2 fan mission by, uh, created by, concept by, something like that, and then presumably an author after it. So we're basically sort of form matching. We're, we're, we're essentially matching something like this. You see, this is Deceptive Perception 2, Phantasmagoria, original concept by William the Taffer. This is, in fact, the only place in the entire mission where this full title is specified. You see, the default title is DP2 Phantasmagoria, but we want Deceptive Perception 2 Phantasmagoria in there, and this is the only place it's specified. But we can't know that the first line in a readme is the title. We have to check that there is a byline after it and then an author. 
Now, we can't just check that anywhere in the text either because there could be a line randomly in the middle of the text that starts with the word by, and then we would get like all the text in front of it, and that would be our title. It would be chaos. So what we do is we only check the first few lines in the file for this pattern. So you can see we're checking the first, I think it's five lines. Yeah, max top lines five, and we're checking for title by author pattern in the first five lines of the file. And if we find it, that's our title. And that is our last resort. As it says here, it's likely to be loose with its accuracy, but it's almost certain to end up as an alternate title that is, you know, a title that's just in the list and is not the main one. So it's cool. And we can say that we can detect deceptive perceptions to title, but uh, it's, it's not really what you'd want as your first line of defense. But anyways, that is it for the titles. And now on to the authors, which is uh, similar, but even crazier. Okay. So notice what we're doing here with the author scan. Before we actually get the author value from the readme, we're getting the list of titles, and then we're passing that list of titles to the get value for, from readme function. Now, why would we be doing that? We're looking for the author. What do we need titles for? I'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> okay. So again, the first thing we do is the easy stuff. Like I said, we just look for the author colon whatever and a little bit of fuzzy matching there. Nothing too exciting. but we get to now get author from top of readme. Actually, I guess we don't do the easy stuff first with author. I guess we do some stuff before it. But anyways, yeah, this is the easy stuff. We do do this before. The order doesn't really matter. I'm just telling you all the different things we do. So get author from top of readme. Okay, so here we do something very similar to the get title from top of readme. We're again checking the first few lines, the first five lines for a title by author pattern. And again, we're not checking it like, you know, all the way through the text because, you know, a line starting with by is just asking for false positives all the time. So we only want to check the top. It's basically mostly identical logic to the, uh, the title search. So that's one of the things that we do here. Now, you'll notice that there's some cleanup functions here, and I'll get to that in a minute. But first, let's carry on here. So if we don't find an author there, we then do the easy stuff and get the author from lines. Now, if we don't find it there, we go get author from text. Now, here is where we use regular expressions, if you know what those are, to scan through the entire block of text for patterns. And that's going to be author regexes. So you see there's a whole list of regex patterns. Basically, it's looking for fuzzy matched, you know, mission for, you know, game, uh, by, or like you know, all different patterns like that, uh, where we can grab our author from uh, throughout the whole text. And we use regular expressions because it's really complicated and these can match pretty accurately with really complex uh, <laughs> patterns, as you can see. So it's, it's not very simple behind the scenes, but it's pretty simple in the way we use it. So that's a full text search. If we haven't found it there, we continue on. Get author from copyright message. Now here's something cool. There is often a copyright message at the bottom of a of a readme file. Well, it doesn't necessarily have to be at the bottom, but somewhere in a readme file, usually down kind of next to the bottom, such as in this, Wicked Relics. This level is copyright symbol by Kfort. Now, the author here is not actually specified anywhere here. You see Kfort not specified here, but we still are able to detect it. And we detect it from the copyright message. Now, again, this is some pattern matching with regular expressions because we want to fuzzy match this, not just this exact phrase, but anything like that. You know, copyright month, year, this level mission is by or made by or these levels are made by or anything like that. We want to be able to detect that. But one extra thing that we actually do in here is that some uh, readme files, for instance, the Legend of the Four Elements 3 here, actually use the at sign as a copyright symbol. But we still want to be able to detect it. But we can't just look for any line starting with an at just anywhere in the text. So we actually look to see if we're in a copyright section, right? We detect if we have a copyright section kind of header here. And then if the next line is starting with an at symbol and generally matches the pattern, then we say, OK, we're going to treat this as a copyright sign. We want to be very specific that we're in the copyright section before we decide to treat this as a copyright symbol because otherwise we could get some false positives. We also do this copyright match at the uh, title by author top of the file match just in case that it matches the copyright pattern up here instead of the by pattern. We do support that as well. Moving right along, get author next line. Here is an enigmatic treasure with a recondite discovery and as you see, 
This one is sort of like the easy section, except all of the values are on the next line instead of on the same line. So we have just a little bit of code here where we sort of say if that there's an author and a, a colon, but then there's nothing after it, we check the next non-blank line, and that'll be our author. Uh, not the next, you know, however many lines, but just the next one because we're trying to avoid false positives again. I keep saying that, but we're trying to be accurate here and fast. So we can detect this with this code here. But we are still not finished. There is one more option left. Get author from title by author line. Here's where we use our titles array. Okay, so you know how I said we can't just look for a, a title by author line anywhere in the text because our, our line might start with by and we'd get garbage? How could we possibly detect a title by author line that is just randomly in the text and be sure we're not getting a false positive? by checking it against our titles list. Because we already know what our titles are, we've scanned them before authors, what we can actually do is we can take a readme file like this, Overlord's Ending. We can scan through it, and we can get all the way down to here, where it says Overlord's Ending by Jordan Maff. But we, we can't normally just take this as our title by author, because what if we had a paragraph like this, like, one day Garrett was walking down by the river, right? If we have, like, if we look for by, we're going to say, oh, here's a line that says by, and there's text after it, and then down must be our title, right? But we don't want that. So how can we know for sure that this is our title? because we're going to look for the word by, we're going to look for what's before it, and we're going to cross-reference this with fuzzy matching against our titles list. And if any title in our list matches fuzzily this text here, then we know this is not a false positive. If it was just any old word here that didn't match one of our titles, we would ignore it. But because this is our title, we know, ah, then there's the word by, and here must be the author. So we can even detect this. That's awesome. And that's it for the authors. And now I guess I'll talk a little bit about the cleanup. When we get titles and authors, oftentimes they might be a little scraggledy. They might have extra spaces or they might have like brackets or quote marks around them or they might have email addresses at the end or just like stuff that we kind of don't want to pollute up our titles with. We want them clean, all right? So for cleanup value, we do a few different things in here. So we're going to remove surrounding quotes, okay? We're going to remove unpaired leading or trailing quotes. We're going to remove duplicate spaces. And we are going to remove surrounding parentheses and extraneous white space within parentheses and, you know, unmatched parentheses with junk at the end of them at the end of the title. Just make our titles, you know, cleaner. There's also a specific uh, function for cleaning up the title specifically because some titles, it says, are written like this with, you know, one space in between each letter and two spaces in between each words. We want to compress those down so that they're just, you know, normal looking. And for authors, we also do the extra step of removing any possible email address at the end of the author name because that just looks messy. So we just have another regular expression here that matches an email address. I know this might look like junk, but that matches an email address. That's an optional uh, parentheses there. Uh, one or more characters that are not white space, an at symbol, another one or more characters that are not white space, a dot, and then uh, between two and five characters that aren't white space. So that's like, you know, blah at blah dot, you know, com or whatever. That's an email address. So our author's now cleaned up. Uh, this is, you know, code Angel Loader doesn't use. Also, it's not very reliable, so we'll just ignore that. And here's languages. Now, Angel Loader doesn't specifically display languages in, in its own section, but it does put them into the tags. So you see, for example, the Burning Bedlam here, we've got English, French, German, and Italian languages specified in the tags. Now, this is not the same thing as the languages here. Now, these, uh, let's see, English, French, German, and Italian, do those match? Yeah, so these happen to match, but they may not necessarily match. This is a much stricter language search because we actually have to play FMs in these languages. So this is a totally different algorithm than this. This is basically just for, you know, tag display purposes. Because languages and FMs are often kind of messy. Sometimes they're in zip files inside the archive. Sometimes they're only partial support. 
It's crazy. So here is less strict, just so you can kind of see. But we do need to scan for languages in order to put them into the tags. So we are looking in certain folders for certain subfolders that are named after languages. And we have lists. We have lists of languages here. And these are all pre-made. You notice I have a ton of pre-specified stuff here. And this is so I don't have to keep uh, building and combining uh, strings while I'm scanning. So we have these languages here, and then we also have other arrays, which are like combinations of these with other folder names. So they're all pre-specified so that we don't have to build any of them on the fly because we want speed. And we also can detect languages from, you know, zip and rar files and, and all that sort of stuff. So it's basically just name pattern matching, nothing too terribly exciting there, but we do have to do it. And then the very last thing we do is that we want to fill out our tags with just a couple more bits of data that we might have gotten. So if RFM is a campaign, i.e. it has multiple used miss files. Then we just add campaign to the tags. And if it looks like our author is anonymous or not specified, then we add unknown author to the tags. And then we just do a little bit of cleanup here, and then we are done. And that is our entire scan. Awesome, right? <laughs> totally. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's super messy, but that just makes it like feel even more awesome when you can scan all of this data out of it, right? I mean, seriously. Oh, and I forgot to mention another thing we do is we also detect character encodings in the readme files because if you know anything about it, plain text is not just plain text, it's encoded differently. And if you get the encoding wrong, you'll get garbage characters. So we do our best to automatically detect the encoding of a readme so that we can get the correct characters. It's not 100% accurate, it never can be, but it's better than nothing, so we do do that as well. We also do that in Angel Loader Main when we're loading and displaying a readme. We we try to try our best to do the uh, detection there. Other than that, I think that's probably about it. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys later. And now I'm going to drink 10 gallons of water.